Thanks for joining us today, Charles. Um, if I could get you to state your full name, title, and job at Future Earth. My name is Charles Ebikemi. Uh, my title is Science Officer at the International Council for Science. So the Inter International Council for Science is uh, one of these um, organizations which really sort of gave birth to Future Earth. Right. It was one of these organizations which came together with a lot of um, other international uh, scientific organizations like UNESCO and G United Nations University. And we put together a lot of the sort of global environmental change programs, um, international scientific uh, core projects working on global environmental change, climate change issues, environmental issues, things like this. And we put them all together into what we now call Future Earth, which is quite a large uh, larger larger sort of remit in terms of its ambition and in terms of its global reach. Right, quite an umbrella. It's very I've been much. noticing yeah. from the, the <laughs> attendees today. Wow. Yeah. What does what does Future Earth's vision mean to you personally? It's a, it's an ambitious vision. I mean it's it's all right there in the title. It's sort of the future of Earth. It's how do we want to live on this planet in society in a way that it's not only sustainable but it's also um, uh, prosperous for not only humanity but also the planetary, uh, I'm sure you've all heard of sort of planetary boundaries and making sure that humanity and the way we live operates within a sort of the safe operating spaces of, of, of the planet and how we use its sort of resources and ecosystems. Right. Can you, uh, can you tell us if there was an incident or a moment in your life that caused you to have the feelings about, uh, about sustainability that you do today? Um, see, th this thing, you know, sustainability, it's, it's, it's really a sort of a, a catch-all term which really goes down towards things from universal health care to um, the way we throw away plastic bags, the right. way we catch fish, the way we, uh, we uh, throw pollution into the air and the ocean. So it really, every day you're sort of bombarded with that sort of notion of what is sustainable what is sustainability how can we live in a sustainable world so it's for me it's it's sort of that realization of every day we need to do better <laughs> in a way. right yeah right that makes sense yeah. so just trying to do do what we can in a more uh, more equitable more long-lasting way exactly okay yeah. that makes sense so not really one moment or thing in general that no it's sort of a slow it sort of creeps up on you it's sort of a slow realization that's that's there are things that you need to do better and right. there are little little things, I mean the plastic bags is one, but there are larger scale sort of global governance issues which, which relate to how, how the world can be more sustainable. I mean, in the, the future of the extremely timely, I mean, we had the Millennium De Development Goals and now we shift into a phase where we have the Sustainable Development Goals, which are very broad, all encompassing and really look at the challenge in a very complex systems way and future is really built to tackle that right. specific thing and not just through one issue but in, in a range of issues and the way they all interact i mean uh, fish catches are not just a problem of um, international law but they're a problem of pollution problem right. of nutritional health for humanity i mean all these things are interlinked and this is why future earth is the perfect vehicle to to attack these problems. Well, that's one of the good things about the conference this week and getting people to meet each other is that uh, it'll, it'll be helpful to have, say, more bio-focused people talking to more oceanic-focused researchers talking about these things exactly. because everybody is so interrelated. Exactly. If I could ask a quick question mm. about that. Uh, part of Future Earth's vision is what they call transdisciplinary mm. uh, work. Yeah. What does that mean to you? It means sort of going beyond the disciplines. It's um, so my background is in sort of uh, uh, as a biochemist, so you, some people would call that one discipline, but it's actually sort of the beautiful intersection of two disciplines. Right. So, and Future of the Religious sort of goes a little bit, sort of takes that to the first logical conclusion. It's about really sort of disciplines working not only among themselves and sort of out with themselves, but right. also engaging with sort of policy makers and people, who, society in general, I mean that's the basic framework, it's science and society sort of engaging in a way to, 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 to conquer challenges and that's what really what Future Earth is about. Thank you. Yeah. And you're a specialist in infectious diseases. Yes right? I am, yeah. How does that tie into Future Earth's vision? Um, so Future Earth really, it covers a wide range of issues, I mean 
most importantly, um, recently I've worked on sort of future Earth initiatives on health and future Earth initiatives on urbanization. And these things are sort of, sometimes you talk about them, they're sort of separate things, but really they're very much interrelated. I mean, as an infectious disease person, Ebola, everyone's heard of Ebola, and that was a thoroughly urban disease. Right. And we're seeing more and more the the urban pandemics are really sort of as a result of this sort of um, urbanization in general. I mean, the, the, the simplicity and ease of getting from one center of um, one city center to another right. within the same sort of region is uh, has really sort of opened the door to the types of pandemics that we could really see uh, in the future, not just from Ebola, but from other diseases such as yellow fever and things like this. For sure. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes sense that there has to be a global uh, a global response to that since we're a global mm -hmm. community as exists. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, do you have a platform or a way that people can become more informed about what you're doing or these issues? Um, I believe Future Earth has the open network, which is sort of a platform for researchers and scientists to sort of engage with, with each other through, through um, not just and learn a little bit more information about sort of calls for applications, calls for to be on scientific committees and things like that, but also just to really get engaged with Future Earth in general and really help craft and design what Future Earth is about right from the inside. Is there anything that you think uh, somebody at home could be doing to help actions uh, people could take or that's a good question yeah I mean there are sort of very sort of simple simple actions right from the from the from the bottom bottom down but it also but the main one is just to be just more informed I mean just to okay. just to know a little bit more about everything from from sort of where the fish on your on your table comes from to to what exactly do we mean by uh, sustainability and ecosystem and just more in general about the, the world around us. Right. Um, is there a favorite read or maybe a favorite documentary film or, or anything that you've watched or, or read that you'd recommend for people as a starting point? That's a good question, yeah. Let me just think about that for a minute. <laughs> That's <laughs> no a very problem. good question, yeah. <laughs> Nothing comes to mind at, at the moment, no. No, we can, we can always come back to that. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, I'd just like to take a minute to ask, has there been any, um, any significant challenges in getting where you are today or things that stand out in your mind as, uh, as challenges that you faced? Um, in terms of what um, Academics, getting involved with something like Future Earth, mm. uh, maybe, maybe dealing with people's differing mentalities. Mm. I know generally in sort of ac academics are very sort of reticent and very restrained in the way they engage with the society. I mean, it's, it's different sort of globally. I mean, in the UK, academics are very, very well versed in sort of public engagement right. and things like this. In the, in, the, in the United States, they're more versed in sort of uh, science policy and advocacy work. Uh, but not all academics are at the same level. And it's really, but there are, I think there's a group of academics out there who are really do care and do really, really, really want to get engaged with societal issues and things like this. Platforms like Future Earth really offer that for them. And it's really up to, up to organizations like ours to really go out there and find those people who really want to take part and to be at, at that sort of more international global level in terms of engaging with the UN, engaging with the G20, G7, engaging with societal actors in general. So there's a lot of, a lot of room, room for, for movement there. Well, I think we found one of those today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and it, it seems more important now than ever in a, in a day where um, people are expressing sentiments like, I'm, I'm tired of all these so-called experts. experts or, yeah. <laughs> yeah, coming uh, from the UK specifically, that one, that one stood out from me as like, wow, we have to be doing something to counter that. Yeah. So I take it that's a, a big part of what's going on for you guys right now? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, even though it's the sort of the, the 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 shift isn't sort of directly aimed at you you see that shift and it's important for sort of the scientific community in general to to react to that i mean it's a uh, an anti expert sentiment isn't 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 a good thing i mean no. it, uh, it's just sort of logically on paper not as an expert it's just not not a right. good thing right. i mean so um, these are things you have to counter counteract and on the other side of that, there's sort of um, how many experts do you need in a room to actually make a, to tell you what exactly you need to do. So that's the sort of balance we work on um, when we're sort of engaged with these policy matters. How do we 
frame the knowledge we have in a way that actually speaks to the other person, to speaks to society, speaks, speaks to policymakers. Because you find policymakers really just want sort of, okay, what do I do? What is the silver bullet? Right. And we need to find a language, a common language, which sort of says, okay, this is how this is how you tell the story. This is how right. we can get to the next step. This is how we get to next. The manner in which things are framed is pretty critically exactly. important, right? right. Yeah. I uh, understand. Mm. Is there anybody that you would like to thank for helping uh, to get you where you are today, or like that you'd to like thank to acknowledge? My, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, award show stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, I've had um, a lot of um, interesting mentors in terms of um, sort of my PhD supervisor and postdoc supervisors. Uh, particularly my PhD supervisor, he was a uh, he was um, someone. I mean, when you work on sort of infectious diseases, it's very it's very easy to sort of lose focus on what exactly it is right. you're you're working on, and as a biochemist, you really I can tell you exactly what threonine does in the mitochondria, but you need that sort of wider picture of what the parasite does to society. Right. That really, right. that sort of the sort of guides your work and sort of that you need to sort of just keep that in mind and keep that reflection going to to be able to actually sort of continue and do any good. Yeah. So, <laughs> what attracted you to to working with infectious <laughs> diseases? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, as a, I sort of, you sort of, at, in the UK particularly, you sort of study at the early age the sort of the basic sciences, and it's only sort of later you come to know how to apply those basic sciences to to sort of almost real world problems. So it was the interest of applying sort of the basics I knew about science to something that actually exists and. That could actually make a difference in people's lives. So that's sort of what attracted to me to infectious diseases, and possibly also a few films which I shouldn't uh, shouldn't be watching. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the case for a lot of us. <laughs> exactly. We do what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if we could just take a pause, and was uh, was there any um, any documentaries or reading material for people that came to mind at all, or anything people should should look at if they want to be more informed about what you do? Uh, There's a couple of personal things I'd, I'd like to to ask, like. Uh, it's a it's a pretty scary thing, and I think in a lot of people's minds it conjures up some pretty pretty frightening images. And is there anything that that might help with that, or help interest people beyond uh, bugs are scary and we don't want them to come here? Um, there's I mean the, some great books by Carl Zimmer. In his early days, he used to write a lot about um, parasites and the weird stuff. Sort of, I mean, parasites are really just sort of um, opportunistic animals which leech onto other. Animals to get what they want out of them. So it's a it's it if you view it from a sort of it's very sort of a, a parable for the way everything works in this world. Right. I mean, it's just um, I can't remember what this book was called, but it's uh, one of his early ones, which was really about sort of um, parasites, but also how parasites manipulate their host to really get what they want. I mean, we've all um, so there are, there are parasites that live in in cats, no, sorry, in mice, that make uh, mice more brave, um, right? Because the parasite needs a cat, a cat, to continue its life cycle. Right. So if the mouse is more brave, they'll get caught by the cat and then eaten by the cat. Would that be uh, <laughs> toxoplasma? <laughs> exactly. Toxoplasma, got it right. <laughs> exactly. It'll actually change the mouse's behavior to <laughs> exactly. ensure that. Um, okay, here's a question: What are some of the more interesting uh, parasites or pathogens that you have worked with? Uh, I worked on specifically African sleeping sickness, uh, which is a parasitic disease which you get from getting bitten by the tsetse fly. Okay. And that one is quite interesting because it sort of swims around in your bloodstream and then it crosses a blood brain barrier, which we don't quite know exactly how. It gets into your brain and then just you fall into a coma and you die. And it's uh, quite interesting from, a, from, a, from just a sort of interesting perspective from how the parasite goes from the fly to the the human, which are completely sort of different environments, and how the parasite really just sort of adapts to that new environment quite rapidly and quite sort of spontaneously. And sort of that's what I really worked on um, during my time as a scientist, was really that shift and how it sort of jumps from one place to another. Yeah. Do you think there are going to be any uh, hot topics in the future in, in, in the field? What are going to be the emerging uh, trends or, or things that we should watch out for? So there's uh, the WHO always comes out with these lists of uh, things to watch out for, and there's sort of a group which um, a lot of people put in a lot of money to combating sort of yellow fever 
um, Lassa fever and uh, MERS, which are sort of three diseases which um, they sort of put in a, a lot of money to come up with vaccine. So there's vaccine sort of right now before they become sort of the next Ebola. Right. Essentially. So those are sort of three hot ones to, to watch those out Those are the big ones. But of course, the big ones are you're always the ones you never hear about right. until, until it was too late. Zika was, the amount of literature you could print off on Zika was about that that much during the time. Right. Now, it's, of course, it's expanded, but we had little idea about what Zika was before it happened. So, so it must have been quite mm -hmm. a crisis when, when it came to everybody's attention. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you find some get almost too much media attention and people aren't conscious of, of things they should be more conscious of? Like well, the big Ebola scare? Or well, yeah. I mean, the big Ebola scare was because the, no one paid attention until it was too late. Until it was yeah, too late, yeah. right. Um, but they're sort of the perennial ones, sort of like the big three in global health are sort of malaria, HIV, TB, and these sort of, um, but it's, it's sort of a, a way the global health landscape is formed because there's sort of very sort of disease-specific targeted um, initiatives. I mean, the, the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, was really set up sort of, um, th the, the way it was set up sort of called for these disease-specific initiatives to come out. So there were a lot of organizations that sprung up specifically to target sort of these diseases which the Millennium Development Goals have listed. And now in the age of the Sustainable Development Goals, there's more, <coughs> more um, talk of sort of the interlinkages and the interactions between the different goals. So what we really need now is sort of these organizations to come up which really target these um, um, goals in a sort of holistic, systematic way. Uh, and that is, will be proven to show that it will be much more effective. I mean, we've a lot of our work as, as well at ICSU has been around about, so if we target this goal, what happens with this goal? Is it how are they interlinked? Is it uh, sort of synergistic? Is it will one go up and one go down? So how, how do these things work in between each other and between each other? Right, so mm -hmm. a good understanding that none of them are, are in a vacuum. Everything exactly. that's happening is going to affect everything mm -hmm. else. Yeah, cool. exactly. Do you have um, a social media platform in use if anybody wants to get to know more about Charles Find or what me you're on doing. Twitter. Yeah. yeah. You can I'm always on Twitter, which is a <laughs> which is a bad habit. Yeah. Yeah. A bit too much. <laughs> a bit too much, yeah, yeah. So please do not find me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Twitter is my go to, yeah. Awesome. Yeah.